At one time in this country, as in many, many other countries going back for hundreds of years, people who owed money they could not pay were at risk of being thrown into debtor's prison. This is a debtor's prison in England, where the debtors worked away on some kind of infernal looking contraption. This old debtor's prison is in Prince Edward County, Virginia. But for the most part, the U.S. outlawed debtor's prisons back before the Civil War. So when you see a picture of that same Virginia debtor's prison now, it's got a county official clowning around out in front. In this country, in the United States of America, we don't do debtor's prison anymore. And yet, in this country, we are still throwing people into prison for owing money and not paying it back. And here's the really perverse part. They owe the money to us. We grab people for minor misdemeanors, start charging them fees and penalties, and then we throw them in jail when they can't pay the debts that we have dropped on them. For instance, Richard Garrett, he lives in Alabama where he spent 24 months in jail over traffic and license violations that now amount to $10,000. The New York Times, in a remarkable article today, reports that Mr. Garrett is sick and out of work, but he can't pay. Another defendant from the same part of Alabama ended up owing $1,500 for what began as a speeding ticket. She found herself in the tender care of the same private probation company that has been so helpful in re-incarcerating Mr. Garrett. Gina Ray got tossed into jail where she was billed again for every day she stayed there. Now Ms. Ray's debt has doubled and the time says she's at risk of being re-incarcerated again for a speeding ticket. Then there was Hills McGee, a 53-year-old veteran who is jailed for public drunkenness. McGee, who makes $243 a month in veterans benefits, was fined $270 by the court and then put on probation. The probation company added a $15 enrollment fee, an enrollment fee for the privilege of being in their program, and $39 in monthly fees. McGee was eventually jailed for falling behind on his payments. There is an entire industry devoted to making money off of people like Richard Garrett and Gina Ray and Hills McGee. The company that's making money off them in these particular cases is Judicial Correction Services Incorporated, based in Georgia with offices uh, in Alabama, Florida, and Mississippi as well. Judicial Correction Services hires itself out to court systems and makes its money by billing the accused. Quote, whether your court is looking for a comprehensive solution to recidivism or just a boost in the fine collections, Judicial Correction Services has the experience to create and implement a system of supervision that works for your court. Judicial Correction Services offers local courts its trademark probation tracker software so they can better keep up with offenders. No need for piles of paperwork, the company says, because the folks at JCS can track each case on their laptops. The video you see here is, of course, only play acting. The guy in that incredibly hideous hat that does not match his incredibly uh, weird looking shirt is just a guy trying to look like a criminal. Just like this jury on the company's website is actually from a stock photo and not a real trial. What is real is the lawsuit against JCS and the Alabama officials who brought the company to town. A lawyer for a firm associated with the case told the New York Times, quote, with so many economically strapped, there is growing pressure on the courts to bring in money rather than mete out justice. These companies they hire are aggressive. Those arrested are not told about the right to counsel or asked whether they are indigent or offered an alternative to fines and jail. There are real constitutional issues at stake. For the record, executives at Judicial Correction Services say they do try to help people who can't pay, and it is up to the judge to decide. The executives say their company stands to benefit from keeping people out of jail and paying. And that's how this works, right? The states add on all kinds of fees from which both the state and the private companies benefit. You get richer when people keep paying. Happens all across the country. The nonprofit Brennan Center for Justice looked at the 15 states with the largest prison populations. And they found fees across the board for simply dealing with the court system. They also found hundreds of people locked up for simply failing to pay. The fees range from paying for a constitutionally mandated public defender to paying 25 bucks for a visitor in prison. You have to pay to just see a visitor, a friendly face, when you're locked up. The fees also amount to a kind of penalty for being poor. Defendants who can't pay the money find themselves serving more time or staying on probation longer. Defendants who can pay the money don't. So the defendants who can't pay the money, who already don't have that much money, end up owing all the more. In Illinois, the state adds on 30% if you fall behind in your payments. In New Orleans, it costs you 100 bucks just to sign up for a payment plan. 
The Brennan Center writing, quote, certainly states have a legitimate interest in creating incentives so that defendants can pay their debts, do pay them. But states need to ensure that they do not end up penalizing the truly poor and enriching private debt collectors at their expense. Joining us now is Thomas Giovanni, director of the Community Oriented Defender Network at the Brennan Center for Justice. Thomas, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. I got to ask you, just to start here, what's going to sound like a dumb question. Why are we doing this? What, does, what purpose in the legal system does it serve to load people up on debt and then throw them back in jail when they can't pay it? It doesn't seem to be keeping people from reoffending. It's not punishing folks just for the crime they did. It's not rehabilitating. What is the purpose here? Well, it's as obviously a bad idea as you laid out. But the idea behind it is that courts are cash strapped and legislatures are not funding the criminal justice system at the level it needs to be funded. And they're desperate to look for people to pay. Uh, they can't force the legislatures, but they do have every uh, client in front of them. So that was actually exactly what I wanted to ask you about. You guys have really done the work tabulating where these fees are. Are we seeing them go up quicker in states where we've seen deeper cuts into judicial systems? I mean, is there a clear relationship in the data? There's not a clear relationship in the data and the trends, but there is a clear trend upwards in, in terms of the activity. Legislatures uh, and court systems are being, becoming much more active as they feel the pressure, whether it's real or imagined. So it's not a one-to-one, -one, mm -hmm. but there is actually more activity now uh, from court systems trying to self-fund. And there were some concerns raised in the article about the overall legality of this. Is this constitutional? There's two answers. Uh, it, it shouldn't be constitutional mm -hmm. to put somebody in a cage for not paying a fee they can't pay. However, there are a lot of workarounds uh, to that fundamental uh, Sixth Amendment protection. Uh, people are being put in jail for failure to pay these fines uh, in civil court cases, uh, like a contempt case, mm -hmm. uh, where you don't have your right to a lawyer. But it's the same cage. And it, the probation company, so they say that, because the, the, they're a key actor here, they say that what they're doing is they're just helping people sort of stay current. They say they're helping uh, prevent recidivism. Uh -huh. They say that they're, they're, they're playing a role in, the, in the, basically the post-jail support network that the courts would be paying if they had the money. Is there a reason to believe that? Uh, is there a reason to believe they're effective? This is the first time I've heard the phrase post-jail support network. <laughs> Um, no, it, it really doesn't help. The, the way that the fees and violence pile up doesn't actually help somebody on a path to reentry. It actually is a barrier to reentry. The more you have to do to get back to a normal state, the worse it is. For instance, if you can't pay a fine, a lot of uh, states will keep you from having your driver's license. But of course, you can't drive to work in a lot of cities if you don't have a car, so you can't pay the fee. This doesn't help anything. It actually just piles up fees on people who are indigent. Most of the people in the criminal justice system, 80%, uh, can't afford a lawyer, so I don't know why we think they can afford these fees. And so is the incentive here that the probation companies actually help the court system make more money? Is that kind of the key in the relationship? That's the goal. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see that it is happening. Thomas Giovanni, uh, attorney at the Brennan Center for Justice. We appreciate you coming by tonight.